This presentation is over the materials in Chapter 6 covering viruses and prions and viroids. Um, it's a relatively short presentation compared to the others. Hope you find it helpful. Thank you. This presentation is over Chapter 6 talking about viruses. As we go through this chapter, at the end you should be able to explain the events leading to the discovery of viruses appreciate the structure of viruses, describe the stages and details of the replication process, explain the significance of viral replication in respect to uh, its effect on disease states. You should be able to identify some methods of controlling viruses, uh, also for using viruses to the benefit of society. And you should recognize the existence of certain types of subviral particles like virions and prions, and then summarize the development of cancer as it relates to viruses. Before we go any further, you will notice that at the beginning of this is said viruses on the threshold of life. So we need to define what life is. And there are several things that we have come to associate with life. First off, all life is cellular. Life has the ability to grow, that is, it uh, can either increase its numbers by reproducing or increase in size, um, such as muscle cells will enlarge when they are exercised. Um, has metabolic processes, that is, they use energy, they produce substances, um, they excrete waste products, and have actually movement, which leads to, can respond to its environment, and it responds to its environment either on a very basic chemical level by moving things in and out of the cell and having chemical processes, or can actually move um, and react to changes in the environment. Now, the nature of viruses, they don't fulfill all of those criteria, so we don't look at them as being really alive. They lack the capacity to perform any of the major life processes on their own. They are not completely inert either, in that once they get into a target cell, they are able to overtake the processes of the cells. And I think of viruses kind of like, um, say a cell is your computer. A virus is the computer pro program. So I have a computer program on a disk, but it can't do anything until it gets inserted into the computer. Now, as a result, uh, many view viruses as existing somewhere between living objects and chemical compounds. Just in general, it is accepted that these are not alive. The study of viruses is known as virology. Um, early work with this began in the 1890s with uh, studies of the tobacco mosaic virus. Act, uh, with Coke's postulates and understanding that diseases were caused by certain specific microorganisms, there was a desire to find out what was the causative agent of the tobacco mosaic virus, or the tobacco mosaic disease. Um, so this character, Dmitry Luanowski, crushed some tobacco leaves that had uh, exhibited the disease process filtered it down to uh, a point where the filter was small enough that any known bacterial size object should have been filtered out, but found that there were, it was still possible to transmit the disease with this juice that was left. So there had to be something that was much smaller getting past the filter that could be carried. Now, later on in 1898, this character Martinez Pedring supported these data with uh, his own experiments using the tobacco mosaic virus. And by the 1930s, they were beginning to be able to visualize this virus, what they were able to do is form crystals of this virus, which suggested that it was actually a chemical compound. Um, it wasn't until the 30s, with the invention of the electron microscope, that we were actually able to visualize viral structures. Now, the structure of viruses, uh, 
one of the reasons that we put the statement was that they are so small. They can be as small as 27 nanometers. Um, that's the size of a polio virus. Um, they can actually be as large as 250 nanometers, which is uh, in the range of some of our smallest bacterium. Um, that is um, in the smallpox virus. Well, the fact is that, that they are so small that as many as 500 or more can fit within a single bacteria. Once we had the electron microscope, we were able to start seeing the structure of these viruses, these very small particles. And what we found is that there are a few major uh, shapes. We have a helical shape. It's basically a tube where we have proteins wrapped in uh, a long cylinder around the DNA. There's an icosahedron, which is uh, a multi-sided structure made of uh, number of triangular shaped uh, protein codes. And they are complex and there are some viruses that can have almost a spiral shape. Uh, there's something called a bacteriophage which looks very much like uh, the lunar lander. And so the ones that uh, the most common shapes that we see though are the helix and the icosahedron. And here we get a view of what this structure looks like. So here is a naked virus with its icosahedral shape. Here is the naked helical virus. Now the components of the virus are very minimal. And the fact is that there's a nucleic acid which contains the genome. And this can be RNA or DNA. For a long time we thought of just DNA viruses, but there are RNA viruses, is that a HIV virus uh, being one, um, the D-line leukemia virus being another. In any case, you can have DNA or RNA, but you're not going to have both. And this genome, this uh, chromosome, can be a non-segmented long strand, or it can actually be segmented. Some viruses have little chunks of DNA that are not connected to one another, but once the whole genome gets inside the cell, they can uh, attach and uh, overtake its function. The structure of this genome, it can be a circular strand, not vastly different than what we see in bacteria, or linear. And RNA is uh, single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded, so we can see it in a couple of different forms there. Surrounding this, what we have is a protein coat, which is uh, referred to as the capsid. And it's made of subunits called capsule mirrors. So if you take a look at this image, what you see are these little ball-like structures that are bound together into slightly larger triangular structures, which form this coat. Now, the combination of the capsid and the uh, nucleic acid is the nucleocapsid. That makes your complete virus. Some viruses also have an envelope. That is, when they leave the host cell, they take some of the cell membrane with it. And it contains often sur surface spikes that will allow for adhesion of the cell. Uh, it contains a lipid coat which can allow it to bind to its site uh, cells, its target cells much more easily. Viruses do not have any cytoplasm, so they don't have any cytoplasmic organelles. They have no metabolic processes. They do not increase or decrease in size. They cannot replicate by themselves. Now, for them to replicate, a virus has to attach to its target cell. And this is very specific. Viruses have one particular type of cell that they will bind to. So the herpes viruses bind to nerve cells. The hepatitis viruses bind to liver cells, and so on and so forth. So they have to attach, and what they do is they bind to some receptor site on the target cell. This receptor site is not a viral receptor site, it is a receptor site for something else that the virus has evolved to bind to. 
you know, once it gets to that binding site, it ends up penetrating or entering the target cell. And it can do this a number of ways, but uh, most often what we'll see is that the target cell will envelope and bring in. the target cell will envelope and bring in this uh, foreign body. Once that gets inside the cell, then it gets uncoated. That is, the protein coat gets removed and the DNA or RNA gets removed or put into the environment. At this point, that DNA will code for um, materials that make up the protein coat. It will code for reproduction and so it, uh, it expresses these and translates all of this into viral proteins. It does this at the cost of the cell. It overtakes its own cell's mechanisms and the, the cell's ability to function. And so it really steals the amino acids, it hijacks the mechanism, and often does this to the extent that the cell dies. Um, it basically just wears it out. In the process, these materials get uh, assembled, so we end up getting um, the protein coat and the nucleic acids put together back into their package, and ultimately they get released. They can get released when the cell dies and it is bursts out. There's another way of release, which we will talk about in a little bit. This is a graphic that illustrates how this would happen in what we call the lytic cycle. The lytic cycle is where the mechanism gets completely overwhelmed and the cell bursts and dies. And what we end up with is getting this DNA coated uh, envelope virus. It comes in, transcription and translation occur, and then it leaves the cell in such high numbers that it will often destroy the cell membrane and result in the death in that fact in that fashion. Now some viruses don't replicate or don't replicate rapidly. And this is called a lysogenic virus. Uh, the viral genome actually gets integrated into the host genome and it can be dormant or it can function at a very low level. Integrated viral genomes are known as protoviruses or proviruses. And the human equivalents, we have an HIV virus or we have herpes viruses. Uh, people who have herpes are often asymptomatic for long periods of time. And then, for whatever reason, the virus can get activated and then they can have a herpes outbreak, which eventually resolves. This is actually typical for many plant viruses. Now, how does this cause disease? Well, really what we see is the destruction of the healthy cells. We've overcome their mechanisms and destroyed them by stealing their resources, destroying their cell membranes and so forth. We see this in hepatitis and the destruction of liver cells by the inf uh, infection and ultimately the loss of liver function if it gets severe enough. In HIV, we destroy immune system cells. And the particular cells that are involved result in the immune system control over in other infectious diseases. A person doesn't die of HIV. He actually dies of other opportunistic infections that come in because these viruses have compromised the immune system. At this point, we need to stop, and we'll pick up in part two of this presentation. Thank you.